Thank you so much for hosting me. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for everybody who's read my books. It is your support of my work that has made this new book possible. My new book is Principles of Economics. It's a textbook in economics. I hope the people in backstage can um, scroll through the slide. Yes. So Bitcoin is more than just a technology for sending and receiving money. Bitcoin overturns the current order of society based on central banks' unlimited power. I think this is something that people in this conference should uh, probably be familiar with. A lot of our life, a lot of our world depends on the fact that there's a small group of people, mainly governments and banks, that can print money out of, no, out of nothing, out of thin air, while the rest of us have to work for it like slaves. Well, what would be the impact on society if we moved away from this kind of world into a world in which everybody had to equally work for their money? Well, obviously I discuss those impacts a lot in my books. But I think one thing that is um, underrated, perhaps, is the impact that it would have on education, and in particular, economics education. So because of Bitcoin, we no longer need the fiat. Thank you so much. Because of Bitcoin, we no longer need the fiat cartel in order to have money. We also no longer need the fiat cartel to sponsor economists in order to teach us economics. Um, if you look at the current world of academic economics, this is a scientific chart illustrating the relationship between modern economists and the central bank. Um, you see around 90% of papers in monetary economics are sponsored by the Federal Reserve. Around 99%, by my estimation, of academic economists believe that you need a cartel in charge of money in order for money to work. I think this is going to go down in history as one of the dumbest things people in the 20th and 21st century believed. It's this idea that money is a technology that can only work if some group of people can make it out of thin air and get to decide the supply and get to decide who gets to use it while everybody else has to work for it like a peon. Well, these people get to decide what gets taught as economics at universities. If you had the misfortune of learning economics at a university, you learned it from people who think we need a monopoly cartel. You know, in the, first, in the same book in which they taught you that a cartel for oil is bad, a cartel for food is bad, a monopoly on housing or any other economic good is bad, they told you that the only way that money can work is by having a monopoly. And why is that the case? Well, simply because if you don't agree, you don't get to call yourself an economist. You don't get to get a job as an economist. You don't get hired at a university if you tell them, I think we should just get rid of the Federal Reserve and replace it with nothing. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> yes, nothing. Nothing is the best replacement. So writing the Bitcoin standard, thankfully, finally allowed me independence from academic economics. And I was able to build my own readership. Thanks to Bitcoiners, thanks to people who buy my books, I'm able to write what was for a lot of the last five years, if you looked at the Amazon bestseller section, in the money and monetary economics section, the Bitcoin standard was always close to the top throughout the last five years since it came out. And that happened independently of academic institutions. I think this is something unique and it's something that's very important. And it's not something that would have been possible without Bitcoin and Bitcoiners. Because Bitcoin opens your eyes up to the fact that we don't need government to run money, you become open to the idea that maybe we can also read perspectives on money that don't come from government. <clears throat> I apologize for my voice. Um, so because of this, I'm able to write a book that can sell very well and it can outsell most of the fiat cartel economists books on monetary economics and because of that I thought this would be a great opportunity to take to write an economic textbook that is independent of the influence of academia. So I left my job at a university and I spent the last four years working hard on trying to make this textbook that I'd wanted to make for more than 10 years now but I could not do while I was in academia because in academia I would, I would have spent four years writing this book and without Bitcoin, without Bitcoiners, it would not have gotten assigned into any university. It would not have gotten any kind of readership. But now, thanks to you guys, I'm able to do this. So what would, thank you. <clears throat> so what would a proper non-fiat textbook for economics look like? 
What would an economics textbook look like if it wasn't financed by the fiat cartel to justify their use of central banking to rob the planet? And I mean, that's basically, you know, if you haven't read your university textbook yet, that's, sorry for spoiling it for you, but that's the conclusion of the book. There's a whole bunch of math and a whole bunch of equations and a whole bunch of noises, but then you come up with the conclusion that, oh yeah, we need the cartel, we need a small group of people in charge of money, we need them to print money, and we need to stop anybody else from having a free market in money and banking, because otherwise, how will they get to rob the planet? So, what would a textbook look like if it didn't have those things? Wouldn't it be nice if economics was taught as a field of knowledge and not just marketing for the fiat cartel? That was the goal from writing this textbook. Obviously, uh, it was influenced a lot by Austrian economics, and so this is what you can expect in the book. It begins by discussing the fundamentals of the methodology of approaching economics and thinking about economics questions. It looks at the acts that people do to economize, under, tries to explain the market order, explains monetary economics, and then explains the importance of economics and capital accumulation and economic freedom for civilization. And so I'm going to just give you a brief overview of the material for the book in the first section of the book in Fundamentals. As I said, we begin with an Austrian perspective, and so this is grounded in human action. It's not a study of aggregates. We don't look at scientific um, sounding relationships between economic aggregates that are made up by economic statisticians. We actually look at how human beings act, and we try and understand the implications of humans' actions and the economic uh, underpinnings of these economic actions. We explain the concept of value and the fundamental difference between Austrian economics and mainstream fiat economics is the concept of value. For Austrian economists, value is subjective. It's not something that can be decreed. It's not something that can be measured with scientific precision. It's not something that's objective. There are no goods that have objective value. The concept of objective value is invalid in Austrian economics. Value is always subjective. It is in the mind of the person who makes that valuation. And this is an enormously important concept which changes the entire way in which you approach economics. And it is the reason why most of the economics you learned at university practically serves no useful purpose other than to get you to believe in central banking and the fiat cartel. And then the, and then the third set of chapter discusses the concept of time and the importance of time to economics. So with that fundamental analysis, we move on to the concept of economizing. What does it mean to economize? And since time is scarce, all of our actions are about economizing our time. And so the actions that people carry out to economize, these are concepts in economics that you've heard over and over again, but they don't get explained very well, I would say, in your university textbook. So I go through the concept of labor, what does it mean, the concept of property and the importance of property. And that is, of course, something that your textbook does not emphasize. And of course, your textbook has very little to discuss about the concept of capital and the importance of capital accumulation for obvious reason, because they don't want you to have capital, they want to keep all the capital for themselves. But in this book, we go through the concept of capital and why it is such a pivotal concept and why it is so important to understand it in modern economics. And then we discuss the economics of technology and the economics of energy and power and why all of these, all of these concepts are the way in which we economize to try and make our time better on this earth, to increase the quality and the quantity of time on this earth, which is how I can like to think of the concept of economizing. Then moving on from these individual acts that people carry out to economize, we have the market order, which, is, which, which corresponds to the things that people do in a social setting to economize and to trade with one another. And that first, the most obvious one is trade, where people trade with one another. And then because we live in a system in which we trade, we are able to develop money. We are able to develop the concept of money, and that is an enormously important concept for human society. And that, of course, is a concept that's shrouded with a lot of mystery in your economics textbook, but I hope that my book helps clarify these concepts. Based on that, we move on to the concept of the market economy, what is a market economy, how it functions, and why it must be based in a concept of uh, private property in order for uh, the market economy to function. And then, finally, explaining the much maligned concept of capitalism. What is capitalism? Why is it so important for people to be able to accumulate capital? And 
really the conclusion of this uh, chapter, what I try to argue is that without freedom to accumulate capital, human civilization itself is impossible. And the danger of the destruction of capitalism is not just, you know, we won't have nicer toys and we won't have a faster iPhone or we won't have a nicer uh, gimmicks. It's going to take away our ability to live as a civilized society. And that brings us to the finest, um, to the topic of money mon and monetary economics. And from the Austrian perspective, we begin the topic of money from understanding time preference. Time preference is the key towards understanding money and it helps us understand credit, it helps us understand banking. It is the concept that at the heart of interest rates. And then in the 15th chapter, we discuss the expansion of money supply. That's a topic that I believe Bitcoiners will find very useful. The increase of the money supply, I argue, is at the root of so much of the world's problems. And it is the reason why governments have so much power. It's the reason why people cannot save. And in this book, I go in depth into the problems of monetary expansion, why it is such a big deal, and why I argue the destruction of money as a free market institution and its replacement with uh, government loyalty points, essentially, is undermining the entire fabric of civilization, which is the topic of the final section of the book, Civilization. And here, you know, a lot of people think economics has nothing to say about politics. Economics is subservient to politics, that political considerations are more important than economic considerations. But I make the case for why actually all economic and political action can be studied from the perspective of economics, because ultimately all of these are economic decisions. People like to present defense and violence as if they are these unique things for which economic activity doesn't count. But I make the case for why defense is just another market good, and it is a market good that is provided on the market. In fact, if you look around you, you see that in the world today we have far more uh, private security officers than police officers. If you want security, you just buy it on the market. You buy your own gun, you secure yourself, or you hire people to work for you in security. And primarily the main role for governments in terms of security is to secure governments, not to secure you. And I think this economic way of understanding it helps you um, get to the reality of economics and the reality of the world much better. And finally, in chapter 18, I make the case for why capitalism is essential for civilization. And I end on a positive note, which is that, you know, if you look around, you see all of those concepts that I discussed for economizing, they are all being undermined by fiat money, by governments, by totalitarianism all over the world. And it's easy to lose hope. But ultimately, human civilization has always faced enemies and it's always faced threats. And the capitalists, the people who are willing to accept the concept of private property and accumulate capital, have always found a way to win, simply because the enemies of capitalism have no capital. Uh, they destroy their capital. Essentially, the only way that you can be consistent about being anti-capital, the only way that you can consistently and honestly and non-hypocritically fight capitalism would be by not accumulating capital, in which case the most effective weapon you will have is slinging your own feces. And that makes you <laughs> relatively easy opponent to deal with for anybody who wants to accumulate capital. Because people who accumulate capital, people who accept innovation, people who accept property rights, develop tools to deal with animals and barbarians and governments that want to take away their ability to live in peace and in civilization. And I believe the tool that we have found to fight the latest kind of animals that are threatening our civilization is Bitcoin, because it is what's going to strengthen us against the enemies of capitalism and human freedom. Thank you so much. Thanks. Cheers. Welcome back. I'm Pete Rizzo, editor of Bitcoin Magazine. We're here at the Bitcoin Magazine Live Desk, presented by Marathon, joined again by special guests, Amanda Cavalieri, chair of the Bitcoin Today Coalition, Marty Bent, host of the Truth for the Commoner podcast, and Jordan Schachtel, independent investigative journalist. We just heard from Saifedean Amus, gave a rousing speech on how government money corrupts. So I want to send it to the panel. We're going to hear from presidential candidates later. Can they fix the money printer, Marty? No, they cannot. The inertia of the centralized system is too strong. The mm -hmm. momentum is too strong. Mm. As Fred Friedrich Hayek said, the only way we can take back control of the money is to find a sly roundabout way mm. to take it out of the hands of the government. Mm. And that is Bitcoin. The it government, sounds like you're going to be skeptical of these candidates later. I mean, they're, 
I think some of them are very nice people. They're very nice people. <laughs> I just don't think there's anything they can do to change the system. Jordan and I were talking. They will not be let in if they can. And even if they do get in, mm. it be made impossible for them to do anything. Government money printer, uh, ruining academia, academia, ruining science. Jordan, uh, your take, can we fix this? The solutions will not be found in Washington, D.C. I agree with Marty. The solutions will be found in places like this where you have brilliant engineers, coders, developers, entrepreneurs um, who are developing solutions to make it easier for people to adopt Bitcoin, to buy Bitcoin, to use Bitcoin. And I, you know, as much as I appreciate that some of these presidential candidates, Congress members, that they are, are starting to discuss Bitcoin a little more, I, I think that certainly DC is not the answer. DC is always where the problem lies. <laughs> DC is where they can print the money and, and debase your wealth and, and make, you, uh, make you poor and have fun staying poor forever through their fiat system. So I, I think that you know, I'm very encouraged by the solutions that we find outside of DC. I mean, right behind us, we have the, the great Mises Institute booth, and they're based in Alabama. So any institution that's basically connected to that uniparty beltway blob uh, situation is, is not good for me. All right. Well, unfortunately, we have to send it back to the main stage. Uh, Flow States and Free Markets. Next up, a keynote with Mr. Robert Breedlove. Stay tuned.